sort of good evening, Manchester. This is Fiat Lux 4, the fourth installment of the Fiat Lux trilogy. Now, you don't need to have seen the first three episodes, Fiat Lux and Fiat Lux 2, Fiat Lux 3. There's a number of talks that are all loosely related around the nature of light. And this one is number four, and episode four is all about colour. If you're interested in the others, I can give you a link. You can go and watch the other ones at your leisure, if you so wish. So what I'll be talking about today is a brief introduction. And then before talking about colour in the cosmos as such, I'm going to be covering how we see colour and how we quantify colour before talking about colours of stars and colours of nebulae and why they are different, and then thinking about other aspects of how we can use colour in astronomy or astrophysics. And finally, a little bit about thinking beyond the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then I'll be summarising at the end. So we can start by asking the question, is colour real? Or is it just a pigment of your imagination? And yes, uh, autocorrect always tries to change pigment into figment. Yeah. So we can ask ourselves whether colour is actually out there or whether colour is simply something we perceive, something invented by the brain. So you could ask, why do we have colour vision at all? Well, obviously, rainbows would be very boring if we didn't have colour vision. And it's widely thought that we have colour vision so that we can tell whether or not fruit is ripe enough to eat. For instance, three fruiting bodies there. Would anybody care to take a guess which, if any of them, are ripe? Tomato. Yep, which are ripe? All of them? Well, if we've got colour vision, it's absolutely obvious which ones are ripe and which ones shouldn't be eaten yet. And that's presumably the drive as to why we have colour vision. That's what evolution has done for us. Personally, I think it's more related to the fact that the maps of the London Underground would be impossible to read unless we had colour vision, and that's what the evolutionary drive has been. Maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong. So we can start with how we actually perceive colour. And I'm sure we all know that the, uh, the human eye, we take light through the lens, focused onto the retina. And in the retina, we have a number of different colour receptors. Those colour receptors basically turn the light into an electrical signal, which gets fed down the optic nerve to the brain. So we're all familiar with that basic idea. And if we say, doesn't that mean the eye is sort of like a camera? Because surely a camera has a lens which focuses light onto a set of photoreceptors. And if we look in detail at what's going on in a chip, we find a whole load of photoreceptors. They're not actually color sensitive. Every pixel in the chip is, is uh, sensitive to the same wavelength of light. So filters are placed on top of each pixel to give a color image, which is, of course, not quite how the human eye works. But when we look at the, uh, the light that's let through those color filters, the red, the green, the blue filters that we see on top of each of the pixels in a color camera, we notice that uh, this is a fairly typical digital SLR camera. We notice the response of the red and the green and the blue, very roughly speaking, each is about a third of the visible spectrum. And they overlap, of course, to make sure that no particular wavelengths are lost in terms of being caught by the camera. And we might assume that if that's how cameras work, they pick up red, green, blue signals, each of which is about a third of the visible spectrum. Does the response of the eye look the same? Do the photoreceptors in the back of our eye look a bit like that in terms of the color response? And the answer is, well, not really, no. The receptors in the back of our eyes look very different in terms of how those things map out across the spectrum. So it's still tempting to call them the red and the green and the blue receptors in the eye. Biologists don't use those labels. They talk about the receptors that are sensitive to long wavelengths or short wavelengths or mid wavelengths. They don't talk about RGB. But I'm still going to label them as red, green, and blue because that's simply simpler. But notice that the red response is very similar to the green response. Not only that, but the so-called red receptors are sensitive to all wavelengths across the entire 400 to 700 nanometers of the visible spectrum. And look where the red actually peaks. It's not even in the red. The red receptors actually peak somewhere in the sort of yellow-green. So although we think of the back of our eye as being populated by red, green, blue color receptors, it's really not like that at all. So that's at least one area that differs between eyes and cameras. And just for completeness, let's remind ourselves that if those are the color receptors, 
and the rods, which aren't sensitive to colour, sit about there in terms of their sensitivity. And that, of course, is why, as astronomers, we use red light at night, because if we use red light, we can switch on the colour receptors and we can see things in red, but the red end of the spectrum doesn't interfere with the rods' response, which is mainly sensitive to the blue and green part of the spectrum. So that's why astronomers use red lights to protect their night vision. So we can ask ourselves, regardless of the fact that the red, green, blue receptors do not look quite like the colour of a camera, in the sense they're not evenly spread over the spectrum, we can still ask ourselves, why do we have trichromatic vision? Why do we have three-colour vision? Not all animals do. Some don't have colour vision at all, and some have very much more than three receptors. For instance, there's an animal which has... 12 different colour receptors, you can see, covering the entire spectrum, including a little bit of the infrared and a little bit of the ultraviolet, as you can indicate from the spectrum at the top there. Any guesses as to which animal has got 12 different types of colour receptors? Any guesses? Not a bad guess, yep. But? Bat, okay. Nocturnal animals don't need colour vision, generally speaking. Therefore, if this has got so many colours in it, presumably it is in an environment where there's lots of light, so perhaps not a nocturnal animal. It so happens it's a mantis shrimp. Why it needs 12 colour receptors, I don't know. Presumably it helps it pick out the food that it wants to eat, I would guess. But a mantis shrimp has a very complex eye system, and other uh, sea creatures are, are similar. But we can ask ourselves, why did we end up with three? Obviously, we don't have to have three if some mammals have got more than that and some mammals have got less. So why did we end up with three sets of colour receptors? Well, not surprisingly, it's due to evolution. If we go back 100 million years or so, we were small furry creatures that lived by night. We didn't come out in the day because 100 million years ago, the, the Earth was ruled by dinosaurs, and if we came out during the day, we got stomped on or eaten. So we stayed underground during the day and only came out at night. So we used to be nocturnal. And since the dinosaurs died, that allowed us to come out during the day. And when we're out during the day, evolution has granted us, through genetic mutation, the use of our colour vision came back again. Perhaps we had colour vision way before the dinosaurs, but certainly it's back once we get rid of the dinosaurs and come out during the day. So it's the result of 100 million years or so of evolution. I'm not claiming that three-colour vision is uh, the pinnacle of evolution. It just happens to be where we are at the moment. And I'm also not claiming that Homo sapien is the ultimate pinnacle of evolution either. I'm sure that mankind has got a little more evolving to do. Where we go next, I don't know, but um, who knows what the next step of human evolution is going to be. Now, as to why visible, again, we're probably all familiar with the idea that the sun emits a lot of its light in the visible part of the spectrum, so that's the area that our eyes have adapted to see. There are gaps in the transmission of the Earth's atmosphere, so the Earth's atmosphere does not let through very short wavelengths, ultraviolet. It lets through rather patchily some bits of infrared. You can see there's a window over here of radio wavelengths. They are let through the atmosphere, which is why, why radio telescopes work so well on the Earth. There aren't many animals that could possibly be radio sensitive because with a one meter wavelength, your eyes would need to be many wavelengths in size. So it doesn't fit for an animal of a few meters in size to have radio sensitive detection. So we've ended up with light sensitive detection. And of course, that means if we want to see what's going on in the universe in the ultraviolet or the infrared, then visible is fine for ground-based telescopes. If we want to go into the ultraviolet or the infrared, then we start putting telescopes up above the atmosphere, such as these uh, UV or X-ray on the left, and James Webb, Spitzer, Herschel, etc., in the infrared part of the spectrum. Of course, we don't need to put a visible telescope in space. The Hubble is up there, not because we can't see visible light from the ground. It's virtually none of it is absorbed. But, of course, we get above the blurring effects of the atmosphere if we put the Hubble Space Telescope above the atmosphere rather than on top of a mountain. If we come back to this idea that our eyes have got red, green, blue photoreceptors, 
As soon as we look a little more closely, we realize it's actually more complicated than that. It's not simply like a camera picking up red, green, and blue and sending the red, green, blue signals to the brain. It doesn't work that way. If we look at what's actually in the back of your eye, there's a whole load of color receptors that are nominally red, green, blue sensitive, but there's a whole load of other sensors, uh, sorry, a whole load of other cells sitting next to the photoreceptors. These are neurons. Now, we tend to think of neurons as being what the brain is made of for lots of processing. But in fact, there's a lot of neurons in your eye. And these do a lot of processing of the signals that are coming into the photoreceptors. So your eye is actually doing an awful lot of image processing even before the signals get sent to the brain. So it's not a question that the eye picks up how much red, how much green, how much blue, sends those signals to the brain, and then the brain figures out what it is you're actually looking at. No, the eye is actually doing a lot of that processing. If we think of what's happening in a camera, again, remember it's um, non-color sensitive pixels with filters on top, and we can imagine that those pixels, which we can separate out into those pixels that are sensitive to red, green, and blue, we can think about what happens to those signals before it ends up as an image on your SD card. And the answer is, not a lot happens. There's a little bit of processing, but essentially, the red picked up by the chip ends up in the red of the image. The green picked up by the chip ends up in the green in the image. There's a little bit of color balance jiggery-pokery. The amount of red and green and blue can be adjusted a little bit, but essentially, what you get out of a camera is what the chip sees in the first place. But the eye does not work that way. The eye has these photoreceptors and these neurons, which means each photoreceptor might be sensitive to red, green, and blue. But what happens to the information? That goes into a neural network because there's a whole load of neurons in the back of the eye. And basically, one of these nodes, for instance, might be taking information from the red and the green and the blue photoreceptors. And it might be calculating how much red is there compared to green, how much is the average of red and green compared to blue. All sorts of processing is being done even before the signals get pushed onto the brain, which does even more processing because, of course, the brain is another neural network. It's a network of neurons. So because we can't see a one-to-one -one relationship between the colors coming in and what signals get set to your brain, it means it's very easy to convince yourself you're seeing colors when, in fact, you're not necessarily seeing the colors you think you're seeing. And a very nice example of that is given by this particular series of uh, web pages. You can go down in the bottom left here and see the web page address. You might want to visit your, this yourself at some point. Can I just check? Is anybody in the audience colorblind? No hands. Right. So you've all got, quote, normal, unquote, color vision. So we're looking at a couple of sort of Rubik's cubes, if you like. There's a cube on the left and a cube on the right. There's a cube on the left, and we're interested in the colors that are on the top face of the cube. Ignore everything else. So on that top face of the cube on the left, how many of those tiles are blue? Somebody shout out a number. Four. Any other numbers other than four? Three. <laughs> yeah, okay, forget three. Yeah, okay, so most people would say there are four blue tiles on the left-hand side. On the right-hand cube, how many of those tiles on the top face, forget everything else, on the top face, how many of them are yellow? Any other numbers? Okay. So are you all convinced that there were four blue on the left and seven yellow on the right? Yeah? Are you prepared to put money on that? <laughs> you can tell from the tone of my voice that something is going on here. You may be interested to know that the four blue tiles on the left and the seven yellow tiles on the right are actually the same color. Yes, you heard me correctly. They are actually the same color. If you take this into a graphics package and actually check what is the actual color of the pixels in those blue tiles and those yellow tiles, you find they are exactly the same color. I can hopefully convince you of that. You may think I'm cheating, but honestly, I'm not. I'm going to take away all the pixels 
other than the pixels in those four blue and the pixels in those seven yellow. If I take away all the other pixels, you see what you were actually looking at. That's what you were actually looking at. You were looking at gray on the left and gray on the right. If I put all the other pixels back again, your brain, whoops, your brain is now telling you that they look blue on the left and they look yellow on the right. That is because the neurons in your eye are processing the data even before your brain gets them, and it's telling you that this thing here is bluer than some of the other pixels I can see. And these pixels over here are yellower than the other pixels that you can see in that field of vision. Your eye is telling you effectively, your eye is sending information to your brain that it thinks you need to know. It's not telling you how much red, how much green, how much blue, so that you can decide what the actual color is. Your eyes are doing processing because that's what it thinks you need to know, that this is bluer than that, this is yellower than that. And your eye and your brain between them are doing this all the time without you actually realizing it. It's not only true of color vision, it's also true of brightness as well. Let me just take those back again, so that's a reminder of what we were looking at. But even, it's not specifically about color processing, but just to give you another example of the processing that your eye is doing, here's another example. We're talking about the brightness of the square labeled A and the brightness of the square labeled B. Most people would look at that and say, well, I can't judge how much brighter B is than A, but it's clearly brighter, until I blank off some of the pixels in the image. And then you realize that square A and square B are not similar, they are identical. Pixel, absolute pixel. B is the same grayness as the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and square A is exactly the same grayness as the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So you know that squares A and B are the same gray. Let me take those two blinds away. So now you know. You absolutely know that A and B are the same brightness. What is your eye and brain combination telling you? Even though you know they're the same, you cannot override what your eyes and brain are telling you. Even though you now know they're the same brightness, your eye and brain are overriding what you think you know about, we're getting the same light levels from both of those, the same photons are arriving for A and B, and yet your brain is telling you B is brighter than A. You cannot believe what you think your brain is telling you. Your eye and your brain are trying to protect you from all the data and only feed you what it thinks you need to know. So that was about perception. How can we quantify what colors exist and how colors work? If you ask a physicist, how do you quantify color, they'll almost certainly response will be a spectrum. And for those of a certain age, that's what we mean by a spectrum. But for most people, a spectrum means the thing that Isaac Newton back in the 1600s was playing around with. He was, of course, trying to reproduce the album cover Dark Side of the Moon by sending light through a prism and then looking at the spectrum. So in the late 1600s, he was trying to establish the nature of light and we now understand a lot more than we did a few hundred years ago about the nature of light, specifically about the wave nature of light. When we look at waves, we can calculate, sorry, we can specify a wavelength, a distance from one crest to the next crest of a wave. And when we're looking at visible light spectrum, we can relate the perception we have of color with the wavelength itself. For most people, it's not absolutely the same for everybody, but for most people, we are sensitive to light of wavelengths from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, where wavelength is defined by that. We're not going to worry too much about exactly what is varying. It's an electromagnetic wave, but we're not going to worry too much. It's only the fact that wavelength differs that give us the color perception that we see in the visible part of the spectrum. And of course, we don't necessarily have a name for every conceivable color, but there appears to be a continuous gradation from blue to red across the spectrum as we go from 400 to 700 nanometers. But that can't be all there is to color. It's not simply a question of saying, well, we can map out the colors and we can give every color a number corresponding to its uh, wavelength, because there are some colors that don't exist in the spectrum of all colors. So, where is beige in the rainbow of all colors? Where's brown? They don't seem to occur in the spectrum that runs from blue to red or red to blue. 
So we need something other than a line that says these are all the colors and we can put a number on each color from 400 to 700. We need something more than a one-dimensional way of specifying color. This has been thought about for a long time and many decades ago uh, an astute group of people came up with the decision, right, the only way we can really specify color is not as a one-dimensional spectrum, we need two dimensions. And it looks a rather odd shape, but basically a committee, the name is in the top right-hand corner there, came up with this is a standard way of representing colors in a two-dimensional space. I am not going to discuss here what those two axes are. Those two axes simply say for every given color, if we look at how much red, how much green, how much blue, we can plot in a two-dimensional color space all of the colors, and they end up producing this rather odd-looking shape here. What's interesting is that if we say, well, where are the spectral colors? Where are the colors in the spectrum? They turn out to be on the edge of this particular range. Remember I said before, beige and brown and other colors don't occur in the spectrum. So these on the edge are the spectral colors running from 400 to 700. Note that it's not particularly linear. It looks a little bit distorted because all of the colors between 600 and 700 nanometers at the red end of the spectrum appear to be rather squashed up. And the colors over here from 400 to 500 seem to be stretched out. And the middle of the spectrum is up there somewhere. But for reasons I'm not going to go into, this has become the standard way of representing colors in two dimensions. Now, there is a little bit of a problem, and that is uh, my laptop and these projectors are digital devices which are generating colors which you perceive based on the fact that we're adding up a certain amount of red, green, and blue. There are primary colors in that projector, and it's mixing those colors to try and make all the colors that I'm trying to show here. My laptop is trying to do the same thing. But digital devices can only display a certain subset of all the colors. In other words, it has a primary red, a primary green, and a primary blue. And when it comes to displaying colors, only colors that are inside that triangle, if that's the red of the projector, and that's the green of the projector, and that's the blue of the projector, that projector can only project colors inside that triangle. Perhaps you notice that all of the colors outside the triangle, all of these on the left, for instance, look essentially the same. We cannot distinguish colors down here from colors up there because the projector is incapable of generating those colors. And similarly down here, all the purples below the triangle, all those purples look essentially the same because the projector is incapable of distinguishing different colors at different positions. That is simply a limitation of technology in adding red and green and blue together to make, we hope, any color, but unfortunately only a subset of colors. So with red, green, and blue primary colors, we can generate any color we like inside the triangle, but any color that lies outside the triangle cannot be generated by my laptop or this projector, or if you're watching a recording of this talk, the iPad that you happen to be looking at cannot generate all possible colors. And that's simply a limitation that we have to live with. So I've given you an idea of how we perceive colors and how we quantify colors. So now we're in a position to actually talk about color in the cosmos and talk about the colors of stars and, in a moment, the colors of nebulae. So we can say, well, if these are all the colors that exist, in effect, we can ask ourselves, can a star be any color? If we look at all the 100 billion stars or more in the galaxy, where would they be if we plotted them all out? Would they be scattered all over this color space? Can we have red stars and purple stars and blue stars and cyan stars and green stars? And the answer is no. We can't have any arbitrary color we like for a star. A star is a large body which is hot, usually a few thousand degrees at its surface, or maybe tens of thousands of degrees at its surface. And according to the laws of physics, it will radiate light with certain wavelengths which are dictated by the rules of quantum mechanics. They can't emit whatever color they like. They have to emit according to a particular pattern which is called black body radiation because the object 
is a hot object, and the vibrations, the movements of all the atoms inside the body produces light with a characteristic curve. And it might be surprising to know that of all the colors that exist, the colors of stars are a very limited subset. Only those circles, uh, not the circles themselves, but the line, which is represented by a few of those circles, all stars must lie on that line. So cold stars will be on the right at the red end, and really hot stars will be at the blue end. But they won't cover the entire range. There won't be stars inside that curve. There won't be stars up at the green end of this. There will only be stars on that curve. That's, at first, quite surprising. It means there are no green stars. Maybe you think you've seen green stars, but remember the color illusion we showed before? If you think you've seen a green star, it's probably because it was sitting next door to a red one or a blue one or something like that, and you got the perception of green, but no, no star actually is green. If we want to understand why stars fall on that curve, we have to start asking ourselves a little bit of physics. We're not going to go into the quantum mechanics, but perhaps you're familiar with the idea that if we heat something up, it glows eventually when it gets hot enough. This particular iron bar has a temperature gradient across it. It's been heated up at one end, and the heat is slowly traveling down the bar. This end of the bar on the left is so cold, or at least it's warm but not hot, that most of its light is being emitted in the infrared, and we don't see it glowing red. But a little further along, the bar is red hot, which means a lot of the light emitted from this object is in the red part of the spectrum. What if it gets hotter still? It looks relatively orangey. What if it gets hot still? It looks relatively yellow. What if it gets hotter still? It looks relatively white. If we could heat it up further, it would start getting a little bit of a bluish tinge to it. But it would never turn green, for reasons I'm about to show you. This is a rather nice little uh, set of animations. Uh, you can go again and look it up for yourself by just Googling PHET. This is a physics uh, website. And here we've got what radiation are we expecting to get for an object at a given temperature. So the temperature is up there in the top right-hand corner. And this is telling you what does the light look like in terms of, this is wavelength here, zero microns at this end, three microns at this end. So you can see where the visible spectrum is. So to the left of the visible spectrum is short wavelength, that's ultraviolet. There's visible wavelengths as indicated by the spectrum. And everything to the right of the spectrum is one, two, three microns. This is the infrared part of the spectrum. So if we have an object at 1,200 Kelvin, that might sound very hot, but in terms of stars, that's extremely cold. Most of the energy of the uh, object is going to be emitted in the infrared part of the spectrum. Very little is going to be emitted in the visible part of the spectrum. So that's why an object at about 1,000 Kelvin hardly seems to be glowing at all. There is just a little bit of visible light, but most of it is coming out as heat rather than coming out as light. And what happens when we start bumping that temperature up? If we go up to 1,500 Kelvin, for instance, two things happen. One is the peak gets higher, so more light is coming off the material, and it's the peak starts to push towards the visible. So it's still emitting in the infrared at the moment, but that peak is now a little bit closer to the visible than it was just a moment ago. And in because this peak is going to get higher and higher as we get hotter and hotter, I'm going to adjust this vertical scale to make sure it doesn't go completely off the graph. So if we go up another notch, if we had an object at 2,000 Kelvin, you can see that we're still emitting mainly in the infrared. The peak is still in the infrared, but now we're getting a fair bit of light coming out at the red end of the spectrum and almost nothing at the blue end of the spectrum, the visible spectrum. So this object, although it's mainly emitting in the infrared, is going to appear to be a dull red, or at least a bright red, perhaps, because most of the light emitted from this object, most of the visible light emitted, is going to be at the red end of the spectrum and almost nothing in the blue. And that's the situation we have, for instance, with a red giant. We've now gone up to 3,000 Kelvin. A red giant is still pushing out most of its light in the infrared, but you can see there's now a substantial part of its light is kicking out in the red end of the spectrum. 
There's also a little bit in the blue, but red is obviously dominating the amount of blue. The red might be an order of magnitude brighter than the blue, so a red giant appears red because that is its spectrum. If we go up to hotter stars, this peak is going to shift to the left. So if we go up to the temperature of the sun, then we get a peak in the visible spectrum. But look at where the red and the blue markers are. Now most of the light is in the visible part of the spectrum for our sun, but that doesn't mean that we see it as only green because there's a substantial amount of blue light, a substantial amount of red light. In other words, the sun is emitting over a substantial part of the visible spectrum. So it doesn't appear red, it doesn't appear blue, it certainly doesn't appear green because essentially all the colours of the rainbow are represented in sunlight. If we push further and go beyond 5,000 Kelvin up to 10,000 Kelvin or more, now the peak in the spectrum is pushed into the ultraviolet and you can see what that means. Now we get more light at the blue end of the spectrum and less light at the red end of the spectrum. So stars that are this hot are going to be looking bluish. There's a lot of light across the whole spectrum, so they don't look like pure blue. All light is represented, but there's more blue than red, so it's essentially white with a rather bluish tinge, depending on exactly how hot that star is. So in other words, if the star is cool, it looks red. If the star is very hot, it looks blue. If it's somewhere in between, you might think between red and blue it ought to be green, but no, between the two, effectively all colours of the rainbow are represented and therefore the star looks relatively white. And that's why the stars follow that particular curve that I showed on the previous slides. They can't just take arbitrary colours, they have to follow these curves which are dictated by the laws of physics that when an object gets hot, it has to emit light according to the red curve. We're not going to go through the details of the physics, but that's just one of the rules of physics that say that hot objects have to emit with a spectrum that looks like that. So that means that when we start classifying stars, perhaps you're familiar with the idea of a so-called Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, if we take any arbitrary star and plot it according to its luminosity or absolute brightness on the vertical scale and its surface temperature, or if you prefer, its colour, on the horizontal scale. Remember that when something is uh, very hot, it looks relatively white. If it's a little bit cooler, it looks yellow. If it's a little bit cooler, it looks red. So you can see that the temperature of a bar that we heat up is not so different from the colours that are represented for stars down at the bottom here. When it comes to thinking about where our sun is, our sun is relatively close to the middle there. It has a luminosity of one because these units are how bright is the star compared to our sun. So by definition, the sun has a brightness of one or a luminosity of one. And the surface temperature of the sun is a little bit shy of 6,000 Kelvin. So in other words, it's represented here as sort of yellowish or sort of whitish, but definitely not green, remember. And when it comes to looking at all of these colours of stars, it's not simply a question of, well, isn't it nice to classify them as how bright and how colourful? It's actually useful for a number of different reasons. We know that stars in the top right, for instance, are large stars. That's one of the reasons they're quite luminous, is because they're very large. Small st stars down in the bottom left, white dwarfs, neutron stars, etc., are down here in the bottom left part of the, uh, of the diagram. We also know that very massive stars tend to live up here in the supergiant part of the uh, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and we know that dwarf stars tend to live down in the bottom right. So we know that size and mass will separate the stars according to luminosity and colour. We can plot them, but then they fall into groups which depend on size and depend on mass. And that means that we can actually use the colour to good effect if we're looking at a cluster of stars, for instance, apart from saying, well, isn't that a rather pretty cluster with a few blue and a few uh, reddish stars? It's not something that we can simply say, well, that's colourful, but we can't learn anything else. Quite the contrary. We can take an image like that, and either professionals or indeed amateurs can look at an image taken, as long as it's in colour, and for every star that's visible, you can measure its brightness and you can measure its colour. 
Now, in terms of its luminosity, its absolute brightness, because these are stars in a cluster, they are all at roughly the same distance, depending on what cluster it is we're looking at. If they're all roughly the same distance, then the apparent brightness can be used as a proxy for the absolute brightness. We may not know exactly what that number is, but we know that the bright stars that look bright are brighter than the other ones because they're all at the same distance, give or take a very small fraction to take into account the size of the cluster. So if we take every star in the cluster and measure its brightness and measure its color and plot them on a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, some of them might be sprinkled over the whole Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, but a lot of them will fall on the main sequence, depending on exactly how old this cluster is. And that's the important thing. We can tell how old the cluster is by looking at the stars on the main sequence. Remember, the ones in the top left are supergiants, really massive. If they're really massive, they will use up their fuel very quickly because they've got a very strong gravitational contraction to fight against. And the ones in the bottom right, red dwarfs, gravity isn't so strong. Their fuel lasts for an awful long time. So these will live an awful long time compared to the short lives of the super giants at the top. That means if we were to take any cluster we care to choose and then map out where these stars are, if we see these stars all the way to the top of the main sequence, that means the cluster can't be very old. These stars don't last very long. So if this cluster was older than a few million years, those stars shouldn't be there anymore. So if we see stars all the way up to the top, the cluster is relatively young. And if we see the stars in the main sequence that stop short of the top left, we can judge by our knowledge of stellar evolution how old that cluster is. So for instance, if they stop around there, that means the cluster must be about 100 million years old. It can't be any older than that, we can judge it from these stars that are no longer there. But these stars still exist, so it can't be older. Whereas, for instance, if we come further down, if we can only see stars about as far as there, remember that's roughly where our sun is positioned, we know our sun has enough fuel to last about 10 billion years. We're about halfway through its lifetime. So if we see stars up to the position where the sun would be in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, that tells us that this cluster is somewhere around 10 billion years old. All of the stars that have shorter lifetimes are no longer present. All of the stars that have longer lifetimes are still there. So we can judge the age of a cluster by just plotting out the colors and the brightness and seeing how far up that line goes. So it's not just a question of, isn't the color pretty? It can actually be useful for us to understand stellar evolution. Now, the actual... Uh, Stars themselves, by convention, we tend to cluster the stars together into spectral characteristics. Obviously, we have different colors. That doesn't tell us the whole story, that this star looks red and this star looks blue. If we take a range of stars at these different surface temperatures and take their spectra, we find that we get this sort of pattern. All stars emit at all wavelengths, but the very hottest stars emit much more in the blue than they do in the red and the really cold, cool stars, only 3,000 Kelvin or so. Again, they emit over all wavelengths, but the red is much brighter than the blue. So it looks like it's perhaps black at one end of these spectra, but remember, all stars emit in all colors. It's only a question of how bright they appear to be. If we live in a galaxy, and there are loads of other galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars as well, we could ask, some stars look blue, some stars look red. What's the average of everything in our galaxy or the average in lots of other galaxies? So basically, we can ask, what's the color of the cosmos? What's the color of the universe? What if we were to average out or add up all of the lights of all the stars that we can see? Well, some astronomers with far too much time on their hands have said, well, let's do the calculation. Let's take a whole load of galaxies. They took how many? 200,000 galaxies within a couple of billion light years of us and looked at the spectra from those galaxies and added them all up and said, right, if we add those all up, if we could somehow accumulate all of the stars in the universe up to a couple of billion light years, what color would the universe be? And the exciting result was the color is beige. <laughs> 
And because they didn't like the idea of the universe being beige, they said, let's give it a slightly different name. Let's call it Cosmic Latte, or my favorite, Skyvery. So it is possible to work the average color of all the stars. Now let's move on and think about colors of nebulae and why they are different to the colors of stars. So we've said that stars and galaxies are, roughly speaking, collections of stars. I know there's other things in galaxies. There's a whole load of gas, there's a whole load of dust, etc. But let's assume that galaxies are just collections of stars, and we know that stars emit over the whole of the spectrum. They might be brighter in the red, they might be brighter in the blue, but on average, they emit across the whole spectrum. But when we look at nebula, we find something different. The spectrum looks rather different when we look at clouds of hydrogen or oxygen or sulfur or other clouds that are floating around in the Milky Way. We see not every conceivable color represented in their spectrum. We see certain distinct lines, hence the idea of a line spectrum. We see emission, or if it's blocking the light from more distant stars, we see absorption, but at specific wavelengths. So why the difference between the two? Well, it all comes down to how atoms behave. So we might think naively as an atom as being a positively charged nucleus and lots of negatively charged electrons buzzing around like bees. Well, that might be a, a rather pretty way of thinking about it, but it has the disadvantage that it doesn't really tell us that all the electrons have different energies. So a slightly better way of thinking about uh, an atom might be something a little more akin to this, where electrons are sort of orbiting the central nucleus at different distances and have different energies. It's very tempting to say, oh, it just looks like a solar system. Well, no, that's not what atoms are. But in terms of understanding that they all have different energies, then that's not too bad an analogy. An atom is actually a three-dimensional object, not a two-dimensional flat pancake. So they're really in three-dimensional shells, which have been cut in half in this little animation there. But at least it does correctly indicate that some electrons are close to the nucleus and some electrons are further away from the nucleus and hence different electrons will have different energy. So an atom is like a ladder of different energy levels for the electrons. And what that means is if we just take two, um, an atom will have lots of energy levels for the electrons. Let's just imagine we have two. If an electron is in a high energy level and for some reason or another decides to drop down to a low energy level, that energy has to go somewhere and that energy is released as a photon of light. The energy is carried away by light. And similarly, if an atom is in a situation where the electron is in a low energy level, then an incoming packet of light can kick that electron up to the higher energy level again. The energy of the light is absorbed by the atom, and that energy goes to promote the electron to a higher energy level. So the bottom line is for any atom with a whole set of energy levels, it can emit or absorb light of those particular energies, and only those energies. An atom can't decide to emit or absorb light with a slightly different energy than the energy difference of two energy levels. So that means that when we think about what atoms are doing, the energy that the photon of light, the packet of light that either is emitted or absorbed by the atom, would have to be a specific energy. And in physics, we know that energy depends on color and wavelength depends on color. Or if you like, um, color depends on wavelength and color, color depends on energy. Wavelength and energy of a particular packet of light are related in this inverse relationship. Short wavelengths correspond to high energies, longer wavelengths correspond to low energies. But the only important thing to take away is that if an atom has got lots of different energy levels, then that corresponds to quite a few different energies, but quite a few specific energies which correspond to specific wavelengths, which correspond to specific colors. So an atom which has a particular pattern for the way the electrons are arranged will have a particular pattern or a particular fingerprint with lines, emission lines or absorption lines corresponding to particular colors. In principle, if you look at the light from a distant object and you find these lines are in certain positions with your understanding of quantum mechanics and your understanding of physics, you can figure out that if I get this particular pattern of lines, it must have come from this element. It must have come from hydrogen or oxygen or sulfur 
They're all different atoms. They've got all different energy levels, so they all have different patterns of line spectra. So you can use that as a fingerprint to understand what the emission is. Now, if we plot those out, remember these are the spectral lines on the outside of this curve. Hydrogen, in the visible spectrum, hydrogen can actually emit two different packets of light, one in the red, at the extreme red end of the spectrum, and one at the blue end of the spectrum. They're labelled hydrogen alpha and hydrogen beta. All that means is hydrogen emitting in the red part of the spectrum, hydrogen emitting in the blue part of the spectrum. Whereas oxygen, different atom, different energy levels, it emits at a different wavelength, in this case about 500 nanometers. That means if we want to, we can photograph distant objects, for instance this supernova remnant, has been photographed in such a way that we're letting through the light at the wavelength we would expect for hydrogen and at the wavelength we would expect for oxygen. If we look at the eastern part of the Veil Nebula, the colour image is the result of red, green and blue of the colour camera and the red, green, blue of the camera is letting through light of the uh, the red light here from hydrogen, so a filter has been used to only let through the red light. So this, remember, is the sensitivity of the camera, but in this case we're only letting through light from hydrogen at the red end of the spectrum, light from hydrogen at the blue end of the spectrum, and light from oxygen, as shown by green here. So the red part of our camera, the red channel of our camera, is effectively telling us where is the hydrogen in this particular supernova remnant. Unfortunately for us, oxygen and H-beta are actually quite close together in terms of wavelength, and the way the camera works, the blue and the green actually overlap with each other, so unfortunately, the blue and the green part of a colour image cannot differentiate between what is oxygen and what is H-beta. So we can separate out H-alpha to know where the hydrogen is. Most of what's left is oxygen, and so we can actually pick out features in the nebula at different colours and we can deduce the hydrogen is here, the oxygen is there. And that's why we get the colour contrast when we combine the red, green and blue together. We get the characteristic um, nebula in which some parts are tinged red and some parts are tinged a sort of bluey green. If we think about it, we can ask, well, why is it that way? Nebulae emit only at particular wavelengths, whereas stars emit essentially at all wavelengths, regardless of whether it's brighter at one end or the other. But they might be made of the same stuff. The nebula might be made of hydrogen. The stars might be made of hydrogen. So why do we get different spectra from the different objects? Why do nebula give us different spectra to stars, even if they're made of the same atoms? It's all down to the density of the object that's emitting the light. If the atoms are well separated and not banging into each other. Each of them will emit the light dictated by quantum mechanics, and they'll all come out with line spectra. But if the atoms are in a dense medium and they're always bumping into each other and elbowing each other, the spectra of all the atoms get smeared out into a continuous spectrum. So if we understand the density of the object, we can tell whether or not we're expecting to get a line spectrum or a color spectrum. So let's just have a quick think about the density of various objects that are out there. Just for reference, how many atoms are there in a cubic centimetre of, for instance, a lump of metal? Well, that's a ridiculous number um, given by all of those zeros there. If we ask how many atoms are there in one cubic centimetre of the air in this room, it's still a really big number. It's still, uh, how many millions is that? Is that uh, 10 million, million, million atoms in one cubic centimetre of the air in this room? Perhaps it's surprising to learn that when we're looking at the surface of the sun, the number of atoms per cubic centimetre in the sun is actually less than the number of atoms per cubic centimetre of the air in this room. And that comes as a surprise to many people. When we think about the rather more tenuous corona of the sun, the number has gone down even further. When we're talking about the outer atmosphere of the sun, we now have only 10 million or so uh, atoms per cubic centimetre. If we were to go into a nebula, it's down even further into the thousands. If we go into the space between stars, we might only have one atom in every cubic centimetre of the space between us and Alpha Centauri, for instance. 
And if we could be bothered to do the same thing with the intergalactic medium between us and Andromeda, there are essentially no atoms per cubic centimetre. That's not strictly correct. There might be one atom per cubic metre, perhaps, between us and Andromeda. So we're not likely to find an atom in any given cubic centimetre if we choose to look at. So there's an enormous range of densities between the intergalactic medium and, for instance, the surface of the sun. But those high densities at the top mean that the atoms are so close together, they smear out individual lines of a spectrum from an atom into a continuous spectra, whereas the density of the bottom four are so low that we could expect to get line spectra. So that's why we see different things from different objects. It's purely a question of how many atoms there are in those objects. Just because the sun is a continuous color emitter doesn't mean it's not worth having a look at particular wavelengths. We might still look at the sun at a hydrogen wavelength or at a wavelength corresponding to calcium because that shows us what those atoms are doing at different heights in the, sun, in the sun's atmosphere. It tells us something about the way the sun is working. So we might still view the sun at specific wavelengths even though the light emitted by the sun is effectively a continuous spectrum. Let's finish with a few thoughts about uh, looking at the spectrum itself. Uh, perhaps you're familiar with this idea that if we look at the spectrum from an object which is moving, for instance, if we have a star and there's an exoplanet going around that star, the star, because they're both moving around their common center of gravity, the star will be moving slightly towards us, slightly away from us. It wobbles as the planet goes around the star. And because of the Doppler shift, if the light is being emitted by an object which is moving towards us, that light will be squeezed together and the wavelength will look shorter. It'll look like it's being pushed towards the blue end of the spectrum. If the object is moving away from us, the light gets stretched out and hence the uh, light appears to move towards the red end of the spectrum. So if we look, for instance, at characteristic um, absorption lines in the spectrum from a star, as the star is moving towards and away from us, those lines will appear to shift towards the red and then come back and then shift towards the blue and then come back. And if we measure those positions of lines very accurately, we can measure with amazing precision the wobble, even at the speed of just centimetres per second, we can detect that stars are moving towards or away from us and hence deduce the existence of exoplanets moving around them. So being able to take high-resolution spectra around lots of stars is a very useful way of finding distant planets. Also, we know the universe is expanding. We can see distant galaxies moving away from us, receding at very high speeds. And again, if objects are moving away from us, that means the light is getting stretched. We call that a cosmological redshift because the light we see is getting shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. If we quantify that by saying how much has it shifted compared to its original wavelength, we call that ratio the symbol Z, redshift. Redshift of 1 means that the wavelength has effectively doubled. The wavelength of a particular line is now twice as big. The shift is equal to the original value. A redshift of 1 corresponds to a distance. We found this out empirically by measuring distances to distant galaxies. A redshift of 1 means that the object is some 10 billion light years distant. And during the first lockdown in 2020, I decided to actually try and image a very distant galaxy uh, I'm not going to talk about all the details, but I try to image a galaxy with a redshift of four. This means it's a very remote object. It's some 25 billion light years away. And this object is actually receding from us at twice the speed of light. And I figured that, like Hawking said at the time, uh, remember to look up at the stars, not down at your feet. So I used the lockdown when I couldn't go anywhere to try this challenge of seeing if I could image this particular galaxy, this quasar, this galaxy with a very active nucleus, a black hole at its center. And I took an image, and yes, it is possible to capture uh, an image of a galaxy receding at twice the speed of light, even without a telescope. This is just with my camera and a little star tracker. At the time, I didn't try taking a color image, but for this talk, I thought, I wonder what color this object actually is. And it is definitely there, but it's very red and very difficult to see. So I split it into the red, green, blue, and you can probably hardly make out the fact that it's there in the red, 
It's very faint in the green, and as far as I can tell, it is not actually there in the blue. So not surprisingly, a very distant object whose light is getting stretched out appears to be very red. And this is relevant not because I think there's anything much I can learn from this particular trio of colours, but just to point out that that is exactly what the James Webb Space Telescope has been doing. It's been looking at images of very distant galaxies and trying to work out, well, I wonder how far these galaxies are. Well, we can find out by taking the spectrum and measuring the redshift. But it's actually much easier, rather than take the full spectrum, it's easier, for instance, if you look at the boxes in the top right, to work out how bright does this object appear to be at different wavelengths. Just like I did the same thing at the red and the green and the blue visible parts of the spectrum, and it's brighter in the red than it is at the blue because it's very distant, that's exactly what the James Webb has been doing. If it finds an object which is very bright at the red end of the spectrum that it's taking, but relatively faint at the blue end of the spectrum, we deduce that this object is very red and is probably very distant. You can estimate the distance from the colour without necessarily calculating the redshift. But this gave rise to a lot of sensationalist headlines uh, back in the early days of the James Webb uh, press releases. They said, we've seen an object with a redshift of 17 or 18 or 20. And then the headlines grab hold of that and say, James Webb has broken the universe because it's found galaxies far more distant than we expected. But no, that was because the James Webb estimated the redshift by looking at how red the object was. Later, it came back to these objects and actually measured the redshift and then found that these galaxies are actually a little bit closer than we thought. In other words, this particular way of estimating the redshift is not totally reliable. Astronomers, professional astronomers, real, realized that, but once the results were leaked to the press, the press jumped on it and said, these galaxies are much more remote than we thought, therefore we can't understand how the universe produced these galaxies. That's just an example of taking early data and not waiting until the data's been confirmed before you draw any conclusions about what you're looking at. So let me finish just with a few thoughts of going beyond colour. I'm sure a lot of us get these questions, uh, especially from people who are not necessarily astronomers themselves, and that is, um, are the images that we see, for instance, from the Hubble Space Telescope, are the colours true colours? And the answer is no, that is not a true colour. The pillars of creation are hydrogen. They should be glowing red. They appear to be blue and green and other colours. And that's because the individual colours that have been put together, the red, green and the blue, weren't taken with red filters, green filters and blue filters. The three colours were taken specifically at the wavelength corresponding to sulphur, the wavelength corresponding to hydrogen and the wavelength corresponding to oxygen. And to keep them in the right order, they've taken the sulfur image and used that for the red channel. They've taken the hydrogen image, used that for the green, and the oxygen image to use that for the blue. Notice that sulfur and hydrogen are both in the red end of the spectrum, which is why the pillars of creation and most other nebulae made of hydrogen appear to be red. But here, they've been artificially coloured, red, green and blue, corresponding to sulphur, hydrogen and oxygen. It's called the Hubble palette because that's the conventional way of doing it, and that then results in the colour image on the right-hand side. And of course, the uh, colours, we tend to think of colours as only being part of the visible spectrum. You can broaden that definition if you wish and say, well, you can imagine colours into the ultraviolet and infrared part of the spectrum. We can't label those colours with any meaningful names, but of course we're just pushing the wavelengths out to different parts beyond the visible spectrum. And so the James Webb Space Telescope has a whole load of filters. It has a very complex set of filter wheels such that it can take data at lots of different infrared wavelengths, which it can then use to make a red, green, blue channel and hence produce a colour image. And when taking, for instance, uh, a view of uh, star formation in the Tarantula Nebula, it's taken three different wavelengths and it's coloured them red, green and blue. Nothing to do with actual red, green and blue, it's just literally a conventional way of doing it. They've taken an image at a wavelength of three microns and they've made that red. They've taken an image at two microns and made that green. And they've taken an image at, what was it, 1.8 microns and made that blue. 
they still tend to keep them in the same order. The longer wavelengths are colored red. The shorter wavelengths are colored blue. But of course, the actual wavelengths are nothing to do with the red, green, and blue wavelengths themselves. The James Webb has imaged this star system at these specific wavelengths because the blue tells them how much hydrogen is present. The, the green tells them how much molecular hydrogen is present. If the individual atoms of hydrogen have, have paired up to make hydrogen molecules, where is all the hydrogen molecule around the star? And similarly, dust tends to reflect a lot of light at longer wavelengths, so the red tells us where the dust is. So in looking at this star formation, they can see where's the hydrogen, where's the molecular hydrogen, and where's the dust. This is important because when you make a star, it makes a real difference as to whether you're trying to make a star out of a cloud of hydrogen that's atomic or hydrogen that's molecular. Again, we're not going to go into the details, but those two types of hydrogen don't make stars the same way. So studying what hydrogen is doing and what the dust is doing is telling us how this star is forming and possibly telling us whether or not a planetary system is forming around it. If you're interested, whenever you look at an image from the James Webb Space Telescope, they're all available on the James Webb, uh, excuse me, web page. Yeah. And if you're interested, well, what do these colors actually mean? Because they're obviously not natural color. Generally speaking, they always list the filters at the bottom there. So they're saying that the blue is this filter, the green is this filter, the red is these two filters. The filters are indicated with numbers that tell you how many microns was the wavelength used. And there's a letter after each filter. Whoops. There's a letter after each filter. N means narrowband, uh, W means wideband, etc. So for any color image that you see, you can, if you wish, always figure out what does the red mean, what does the blue mean, because it corresponds to these filter wavelengths which are given at the bottom. So to wrap up, the four takeaway messages from this talk, I guess, are the eye is not a camera. The eye is a far more complex beast than a camera. It does not record red, green, blue uh, light intensities and feed that to the brain for the brain to make sense of. It is far more complex in the processing that is carried out in the eye before that information is piped down the optic nerve to the brain. We know that the colors of stars are determined by the laws of physics that say you must have a particular variation of intensity of light with wavelength. It's called black body radiation. And that means stars can only be red or whitish or bluish. They cannot be green as such. And the colors of nebulae are decided by the atoms that make up those nebulae. Are we talking about atoms of hydrogen or sulfur or oxygen or other elements that exist in nebulae? That will determine the fingerprint of the emission spectrum that we see. And finally, as I'm sure some of you already know, breaking light down into its spectrum can be enormously useful because it can tell us not only atomic composition, because each fingerprint of every atom is different, it can tell us what things are made of, and we can use the spectrum and looking at the motion of lines in the spectrum to determine the velocities of objects, whether they be stars or uh, other uh, features in uh, the system that we're interested in. We can measure velocities, and by understanding the way the universe is expanding, we can convert that velocity effectively into a distance as well. So color can tell us an awful lot, and perhaps the only real takeaway message is color is probably not what you thought it was. Thank you all very much for listening. <laughs>